Sutra 19 Cha and there is a form of the Supreme Lord which Vikara Avarti does not abide in the effect. He because ah the Upanishad has stated his existence, tata, in that manner. Translation. And there is another form of the Supreme Lord that does not abide in the effect, for so has the Upanishad declared. And it is not a fact that the Supreme Lord resides merely in the solar orb, etc., within the range of effects, that is, changeable things. He has also another aspect which is eternally free and transcendental to all changes. Thus it is that the scripture speaks of his existence in two forms. In his divine majesty spreads that far. The whole universe of all of these beings is but a quadrant of his. But Purusha, the infinite being, is greater even than that his three immortal quadrants being established in his own effulgence. Chandogya Upanishad 3, 12, 6, and other passages. It cannot be asserted that this changeless aspect is attained by those who stick to the other qualified aspect, for they have no desire for that. Hence, it is to be understood that just as with regard to the Supreme Lord, possessed of two aspects, one may continue in his qualified aspect, possessing limited powers without attaining his unqualified aspect, so one can exist in his qualified aspect with limited divine powers without acquiring unfettered powers. Sutra 20 Darshayatash Chaivam Pratyakshanumane Cha and pratyaksha anumane, direct knowledge, that is, Upanishads, and inference, that is, smriti, darshayataha, show, evam, thus. Translation. And both the Upanishadic and smriti texts show thus, that the supreme light is beyond all changing things. The Upanishadic and Smriti texts also show that the Supreme Light is transcendental to all changes, in such passages as, There the sun does not shine, neither do the moon and the stars, nor do these flashes of lightning shine. How can this fire? He, shining, all these shine. Through his luster are all these variously illuminated. Katopanishad 2.2.15, Shvetashvatar Upanishad 6.14, Mundak Upanishad 2.2.10. The sun does not illuminate that, nor the moon, nor fire. Gita 15.6. Thus, it is a well-known fact that the supreme light is beyond all changing things. This is the idea. Sutra 21 Boga Matra Samya Lingacha Cha also Boga Matra Samya Lingat from the indicatory mark in the Upanishads about the equality of mere experience. Translation also from the indicatory mark in the Upanishads about the equality of experience alone, it is known that the liberated souls do not get unfettered powers. Here is an additional reason to show that those who hold on to the effect, that is, the conditioned Brahman, 
do not get unfettered powers. Four, from the indicatory marks declaring their difference as contained in the following Upanishadic passages, it is clear that all that they have in common with the eternally existing God is an equality of experience only. For example, he, that is Hiranyagarbha, said to him when he had reached his world, the liquid nectar alone is enjoyed by me, for you also it is the thing to be enjoyed. Kaushitaki Upanishad 1.7 As all beings adore this deity, so do they adore him who knows him. Brihadaranyaka 1.5.20 Through it he gains gradual identity or equality of body with the deity or lives in the same world with him. Brihadaranyaka 1.5.23 opponent. From such a point of view, the powers will have degrees, and so they will be subject to termination. Hence, these liberated souls will be liable to returning to this world. Vedantin. Hence follows the reply of the venerable teacher Badarayana. Sutra 22. Anavriti shabdanavriti shabdat anavritihi, there is no return. Shabda, on the authority of scriptures, anavritihi, shabda, no return on the authority of scriptures. Translation, there is no return for the released souls on the strength of the Upanishadic declaration. There is no return for the released souls on the strength of the Upanishadic declaration. Those who proceed along the path of the gods associated with the nerves and the rays of the sun and divided into the stages of light, etc., reach the world of Brahman as described in the scripture thus. In the world of Brahman, existing in the third order of heaven, that is, Brahmaloka, counted from this earth, there exist two seas called Ara and Nya, where is to be found a lake full of delightful food, where exists a banyan tree exuding ambrosia, where there is to be seen a city of Brahman called Aparajita, the unconquered, and where stands a golden palace made by the Lord himself. Chandogya Panishad 8.5.3 that world is also spoken of variously in the mantra and eulogistic Artavada portions. After reaching there, they do not return as others do from the world of the moon when deprived of their enjoyment, that is, having run through their quota of experience. How is this known? From such Upanishadic passages as, Going up through that nerve, one gets immortality. Katupanishad 2.3.16, Chandogya Upanishad 8.6.6. They no more return to this world. Brihadaranyaka 6.2.15. Those who proceed along this path of the gods do not return to this human cycle of birth and death in Manu's creation. Chandogya 4.15.5. He reaches the world of Brahman and does not return here. Chandogya 8.15.1. And even though their powers come to an end in time, it was shown how one has no return under the aphorism, on the final dissolution of the world of the conditioned Brahman, they attain along with the Lord of that world what is higher than the conditioned Brahman. Sutra 4.3.10. But non-return stands as an accomplished fact for those from whom the darkness of ignorance has been completely removed as a result of their full illumination, and who therefore cling to that liberation as their highest goal, which exists ever as an already established fact. The non-return of those who take refuge in the qualified Brahman becomes a fact only because they, too, have that unconditioned Brahman as their ultimate resort. The repetition of the portion, there is no return on the strength of the Upanishadic declaration, shows 
that the scripture ends here. Namaste. So there you have it. The conclusion of Brahma Sutra is probably the most important section of the Vedic literature because the truths in this section form the basis of so many other narrations, I mean, throughout the Vedas and Puranas, the Shruti and the Smriti. What's going on here is that the ultimate end of all the Vedic knowledge is being expressed. Brahma Sutra is also known as Vedanta Sutra. Veda means knowledge or the Vedic literatures, and anta means the end or the conclusion. So the conclusion of all Vedic literatures is that one becomes enlightened in the supreme Brahma, either in the relative conditioned Brahman with qualities, the saguna Brahman, or in the original unconditioned Brahman without qualities, nirguna Brahman. And indeed, the Nirguna Brahman is the final destination even of those who become enlightened in the relative, qualitative Brahman. Because when the universe is wound up at the end of creation and destroyed in the Shiva Tandava, the dance of Shiva, well, it's burnt to ashes. Now, that's why we say this prayer when we put the Tripundra Earth is ashes, water is ashes, fire is ashes, air is ashes, space, even Akasha, is ashes because it all gets burnt to ashes at the end and then reabsorbed into the Nirguna Brahman, the unqualified Brahman, the supreme Brahman. Now, what happens to those souls who do not become enlightened at the end of the universe? They are also merged into the Supreme Brahman, but so is their state. So all the data that would normally create their next body immediately after this one is put with them into, let's say, cold storage. Huh? And then they reawaken in the next creation, which is, you know, an unknowable amount of time. Well, there is no time. <laughs> A timeless interval, let's say. So let's not focus on them because, you know, they're the losers, right? <laughs> but those who do become enlightened <clears throat> can stick with the deity, the form of God, that they worship to reach enlightenment. And they get all kinds of divine powers. But let me tell you something. The way you get into Brahman realization is by ignoring mystic powers, or if you will, cultivating only one mystic power, which is how to please God. So according to the deity that you worship, who is your Ishta Devata, your chosen form of God, then you should learn everything about what he or she prefers and do that. Huh? Become that. Offer it. Use it in your worship. For example, there's a well-known saying in India that Vishnu Aishwarya Priya Shiva Abhisheka Priya. Okay, what this means is Vishnu loves luxury, he loves opulence, he loves uh, ceremony and formality, and you know, going by the book <laughs> like that tradition. Huh? Agama. But Shiva likes bathing, Abhisheka, 
we bathe Shiva, the Shiva Linga, with various precious substances and so on. This is wonderful service. He loves this. He very easily becomes satisfied by it. And just one mantra, Aum Namah Shivaya, is enough. This is my experience. Huh? Anyway, Shiva, or even by worshipping Devi, Shiva becomes satisfied. During my years in Tiruvannamalai, I worshipped a goddess almost exclusively. But Shiva kept coming and giving me visions and stuff, especially on Mahashivaratri night. Uh, I mean, he would wake me up in the middle of the night and give me a vision, darshan of himself. And I hadn't even begun chanting Shiva mantra. But see, goddess or Devi or Shakti, the conditioned Brahman, wants to bring us to Shiva or unconditioned Brahman because she loves him. And that's her service, is creating all these conditioned souls who then become enlightened and worship the Supreme Shiva. But he enjoys this. It's a game, you know, for him. <laughs> it's very casual and matter of fact, actually, with both of them. But for us, it's a very big deal because it means the end of birth and death in the material world, the end of ignorance, the end of suffering, satisfaction of all desires, attainment of all the pleasures and the things that we want. Hmm? So for us, it's a very big deal that Ma, you know, uh, Shakti, Maya, offers this instruction through the Vedas and the Tantras and the Itihasas and the Agamas, huh? all the traditions that have come down from the past, ultimately in the Brahma Sutra or Vedanta Sutra the end or the conclusion of the Vedic wisdom. Why is it concluded? Because when one reaches enlightenment, there is no more need for scriptures. One is directly in contact with Brahman itself, either in the form of Shiva or Shakti or Vishnu or Hiranyagarbha or any of the goddesses, whatever. Uh, so he gets instruction directly, personally, from them. And like I said, the main mystical power that you want to try to cultivate is pleasing your deity, your Ishta Devata, your ideal form of God. Because not only is that is how you uh, enter, they have to become qualified to enter the spiritual world. But it's also going to be your identity and your activities when you're there. Of course, I'm talking about those who realize the conditioned Brahman. Those who realize unconditioned Brahman simply disappear and are never seen again. <laughs> and that will happen with all of us. That is our ultimate destination. Just that if we want to retain a tiny bit of ego, uh, the fun part of ego, which is a loving relationship of service to the Supreme in any form, uh, that's all right. We can cling to that, Shankara says. But ultimately, at the collapse of the entire manifestation, we have to give up even that. And it's a pleasure. It's done out of love. Because after a prolonged stay in the even the conditioned Brahman, one realizes clearly that all form and all activity are maya. Uh, and they're all ultimately painful, suffering as the Buddha calls it, fire. He says the senses are ablaze. The mind is ablaze. The whole universe is ablaze. It's burning. It's burning up. 
And we see this everywhere. The stars, the galaxies, even the human body is a, basically a heat machine. By burning fuel, it creates heat. And that's how it functions. So it's burning. So it's ultimately all suffering. And we don't want that suffering. So at the end, when the heat becomes unbearable, when Shiva is doing his Tandava, uh, his dance of destruction, we gladly leave off the even small vestiges of separate individuality and blissfully merge into the eternal Brahman, never to be seen again. Aum Tatsa, Aum Shakti Aum, Aum Namah Shivaya.